Well, hello, Cove Church. So great to be with you once again as we continue our series around Lent called Seek. Today, talking about what it looks like to seek Jesus for change. You know, we recently got a video of my youngest son, Isaac's birth and early years. Their grandpa, Ron, was kind enough to transfer these old formats onto something we could actually see. We hadn't seen it for a long time, uh, probably not since those events happened. Uh, The kids joke about it, that being kind of the second born syndrome, that Ethan, we have video of Ethan's first hiccup, Ethan's first solid food, Ethan's first smile. And with Isaac, it goes from a snapshot of him at three months old to his graduation pictures. That's like how it works when you're second born. So we got these and we're watching them. And we're watching the, these videos of Isaac's birth and Isaac in very early years. And, and we're watching them all together, Ethan, Isaac, Riley, Paula, and myself. And I found myself when watching it, I was back in that moment when he was being born. And it was actually a little bit emotional. I was trying to hide it, I trying to make sure they didn't see it. But for me, it brought it all back. See, when Isaac first came into the world, it took him a little while cry and the doctor was working on him using that turkey baster thing in his nostrils you know doing stuff you know patting on his back and things and so I'm watching all of that on this video knowing that in that moment baby Isaac is yet to breathe and until he breathes in the video it's as though I can't breathe I have the exact same feeling I did in that moment. It's like you're holding your breath, waiting. And, and all those questions are in your mind. What, what happens if he's not okay? What, 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 is this going to end well? I'm having all of those feelings again, watching this video while Isaac, grown Isaac, is sitting right there on the couch, you know, and he's, he's totally great, he's healthy, he's terrific. So I know how the story ends, yet something in me, it couldn't relax until I heard that sound, the sound of a baby's cry. I find it fascinating. Why is it that the most comforting thing for a parent to hear in that moment is the sound of the discomfort of their child? All we want in those first moments is to hear our child cry, and then all we want for the next three years is to make the crying stop. (laughs) And I think how quickly our desires change. Yet we also know that our desires change because circumstances change and needs change. The timing changes. And in fact, it reminds us of this truth. Change is a constant in life. Change is the constant in life. And in that we recognize the ability to, to, for us to change is actually an essential skill we need if we are going to see God's best. See, I find this to be true, whether you're a Christ follower or not, because if there is a prevailing thought in our world, it would certainly include this sentiment. Things need to change, right? You name it, from politics to the climate to prejudice to social media to poverty, everywhere we look, things are not right. We know things need to change. We're not exactly sure how to change them which is right where Jesus wants to meet us today as we discuss what it looks like to seek Jesus for change. But before we do that, I want to make sure we guard against something. We guard against this tendency to say, okay, all of the change that is important, it has to happen out there. Okay. Could I remind us that Jesus told us, I need you to get the plank out of your own eye before you mess with the speck in someone else's. He's telling us, that change always starts with us. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What we see here is that it is only in allowing ourselves to be changed 
to be transformed, that we can in turn truly see the God who is unchanging. Our world says, let's make sure they're changing out there, but God says, let's make sure you are changing. George Bernard Shaw said it this way, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Because until I change, until my thinking is transformed, I will continue to bring the same problems with me. I can't tell you how often I've encountered this in doing ministry now for 25 years, um, just, just working with people. There's no judgment in this, but it's absolutely true. I'll, I'll encounter a person that says, I just don't get it. You know, I think I'm getting ahead. I, I think I'm moving forward. Things are getting better. And then some, suddenly something happens and it all falls apart. And they say it happens the same way every time. No matter what I do, it always falls apart. I think I'm going, going forward, but it always falls apart. And they'll say, I don't understand the problem. I must just be really unlucky. No, that is not the problem. The problem is not that you're unlucky. The problem is you're totally consistent. Everywhere you go, you bring you with you. The one constant in all of those circumstances is you. <laughs> so have we considered perhaps the change that needs to take place is in you? Perhaps the change that needs to take place if I'm facing those circumstances is in me. I find this amazing. The one person we have the power to affect change upon is often the one we are least likely to ask to do so. We don't ask ourselves to change, yet Jesus does. He says, be transformed, be a new creation. In fact, Jesus is the great change agent, the great catalyst for change. So that becomes the starting point of this discussion. That's the foundation. Let it start with me. But Jesus is so good because even as we are figuring out what it looks like for him to change us, he still works at changing things around us. And so I want to highlight a passage that shows Jesus doing that very thing, giving us insight into what Jesus wants to change in our world if we would choose to seek him. So here's the first thing. Jesus is a catalyst for community change. Jesus is a catalyst for community change. We're going to be in Matthew 21, verses 10 through 11 is where we start. In fact, right where you are, let's read it together. Big voices, go. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The whole city was stirred. You know what that means to me? It means that Jesus can change communities, that Jesus can stir cities. And it wasn't like their city was just so easy. You know, it had all the same factors, the same flaws as our cities. It had poverty and illness and prejudice and corruption and political division. It had all of that, just like our cities do. Yet Jesus shows up and the city was stirred. And get this, I don't, I don't know how it worked, but it says the city asked the question, who is this? That is a wild thought to me. Could it be that we could become a people so dependent on Jesus, so consumed with letting him find us and redeem us and change us that our city would say, who's doing this? <laughs> that our city would sense a movement, a stirring, not tied to a personality, not tied to a program, not tied to a political endeavor, that our city would ask the question, who is this? They would ask, why are things changing? Who is responsible? And the only true answer that we could give is this, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Because Jesus changes cities. You know, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the, the high school small group over at our house. It was on St. Patrick's Day. 
And because uh, they do that as part of their system now, they have small groups in, in houses. We were one of those. And it was great, loved having them there. And um, Paula made a cake for that night. She makes this particular cake that's really, really a great cake. Um, but because it was St. Patrick's Day, she put a little bit of green food color in it. You couldn't see that. But, but Isaac, at the end of the, you know, right before it was served, he put on green fro frosting because it was St. Patrick's Day. You got to make it green. So some of the students saw him putting on the green frosting. So as they're going through the line and they're, and they're getting the cake, they kept saying, Isaac, thanks for making this cake. Good job on the cake. This is a really good cake. Thanks for making this. And over and over, Isaac had to tell them, I, I, I didn't make it. I, I just put frosting on it. Mom, Mom made it. I just frosted it. I, I didn't do anything. I just, I just put frosting on this. And that, that conversation happened several times. He had to deflect over and over to point out who really made that happen. That's what could happen in our city. Over and over, people going, wow, this, this is great. Wow, what a terrific thing this is. And the only honest answer will be, oh, oh, I didn't do that. Jesus of Nazareth did that. I mean, maybe we frosted. Maybe we, we put some frosting on the cake. But Jesus made this cake. Jesus made this happen. See, the question is never, can Jesus change a city? The question is, will we seek Jesus to do so? The Bible is filled with stories of cities that people said were unredeemable. Nineveh comes to mind. The prophet Jonah didn't even want to go there. Why? Because he knew God would save it. And God did, despite Jonah's hesitancy. The lesson is this. God loves to save seemingly unsavable cities, which means God can save ours. God can save yours. Because Jesus is a catalyst for community change. It's the first thing. Here's the second. Jesus is a catalyst for church change. Let's continue the passage. Matthew 21, verse 12 and 13. Big voices go. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. I find it interesting how we as people, even well-meaning people, that we can easily drift from what's most important. And we see that especially with Jesus, as often his most, most scathing rebukes were leveled at the church of the day, the religious of the day, a church that had become very much more interested in image, had become very interested in money, in the outward appearance of piety while inwardly living far from God's heart. A church that leaned on its own strength, not God's. A church that burdened others in a way that God never asked them to. And I'm struck by the fact that if Jesus had to address that then, that Jesus still has to do that now. That Jesus is still wanting to turn the tables of his church and address the places that we've missed it. And friends, we get to let Jesus do that. Because churches change when people seek Jesus. We've, we've begun this season, uh, starting in January, with these days as a church of seeking Jesus on the fourth Friday of every month. Um, we just did one. And uh, I can tell you, things are changing. We're seeing healings, we're seeing restorations in relationships, we're seeing miraculous provision. Along with that, we're seeing that the many challenges of spiritual battle that comes with it. It's all included because the same light that Jesus brings actually draws the moths, too. <laughs> That's the amazing thing about seeking Jesus. When we do so, we find him. He shows up. And he even comes to the church, even to Cove Church. And he says, um, by the way, there's some tables that need flipping. I'm going to do that now. Think of all the ways Jesus has already done that. COVID, that was a flip table. 
racial unrest, a flip table, political division, a flip table, war in Ukraine, a flip table. Jesus will just keep doing so. Jesus will continue to address our culture, address the places that we're not seeking him as a church. Flip, flip, flip. He'll turn those tables because this passage shows us this truth. Jesus will keep flipping the tables of his house until it becomes a house of prayer. That's why you have seen in our midst a greater emphasis on prayer. That's not because we're so smart. No, it's because Jesus is so good. It's something Jesus is doing. It's not so we can boast in ourselves and say, look how much we're praying. Oh, how much does your, your church pray? Oh, not so much. Oh, that's so sad. Well, we pray a lot, you know? No, that's actually completely the opposite of what this is all about. We seek Jesus not to recognize our ability to pray, but instead to recognize our need for the one we pray to. We need him. When we rely upon organization, we get what an organization can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely upon eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. The list goes on and on. But when we rely on prayer, we get what God can do. And that, friends, is what our church needs. Our church needs the changes that only Jesus can bring, the tables that only Jesus can turn. And yes, it's a bit messy, and it messes with us because we don't always like that kind of change, but it's so needed. For me, I'm, I'm a bit back and forth when it comes to change. In certain things, I really, really like change. I love new experiences. I, I love mixing up the norm. I love adventure. If someone says to me, Aaron, hey, you want to come do X, Y, Z? Nine times out of, out of 10, the answer is going to be yes. That sounds great. Now that's not to give you ideas. Don't make me do bad things. <laughs> Send me out. Yeah, let's jump off of this cliff. Okay. So yeah, not to give you ideas. But if it sounds fun, I'm going to be fully in. That kind of change for me is fun. But I find that I also like a lot of things to be predictable. I like to be on time. I like to plan and to prepare appropriately. In fact, the other day, um, we were prepping to go and lead a, an assessment for those that are gonna be starting churches. I might've mentioned it, um, but there was a bunch of printing we had to do prior to that. I had allotted two hours for us to do some printing before we left. It ended up taking five hours. There was so much to print. And in the midst of seeing how much longer it was taking, you know, they're trying to give me jobs. You know, we've got these piles of paper everywhere. Paula's there and, and Riley's there. And, and, and I'm starting to pace from pile to pile. And I'd like move one sheet of paper to this point, And then I just pace again. I just, I was just like a caged animal. If they had volume, they would have given it to me. <laughs> that change for me was not fun. I didn't like that kind of change. But because of that change, I had to change. I had to trust. Guess what? Jesus is always attempting to change his church, to grow his church. And growth in the church does not come easy and it is never comfortable. As Jesus is turning over the tables, I'm sure here, the disciples were like, hey, would you take it easy? Those are nice doves. I used to buy doves from that salesperson. They've been there forever. We bought doves here in this place my whole life. Why do you want to change that? And Jesus says, it's time to change. You don't need doves. You need prayer. Jesus will always challenge his church to do more. And we get to allow him to turn any table that needs turning because Jesus is a catalyst for church change. That's the second thing, here's the last thing. Jesus is a catalyst for individual change. Matthew 21, we'll finish out the passage. Let's read it, big voices go. 
The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. It is this change right here that makes all the other changes possible. As individuals change, churches change, and communities change. It says the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. This is what seeking Jesus does. You know, in these last few years, I've watched Jesus do things that are astounding not because we've figured it out, but because we've decided we can't figure it out. So we simply choose to seek Jesus instead. I'm, I'm watching friends be healed of debilitating injury. I'm seeing other friends delivered from years of addiction. I'm being told stories of how God is miraculously bringing people into our community because they're there to make a difference. I'm watching those who have been limping along in life due to church wounds and hurt. They're finding their way back to the loving Savior. Why? Because people change when we seek Jesus. Maybe there's some people that you want to see changed by the love of God. Jesus still does that. Jesus is great at changing people. More accurately, it's, it's when we stop and let him find us that we're changed. And, and it's that moment that makes everything different. And I love that, that the temple here was filled with the blind and the lame and the broken. Could this place look like that? I love the difference this shows us in how God's people are supposed to look. We see Jesus turn the tables on this, this pristine image and on this opulence and this external piety. And in doing so, Jesus makes room for real people, imperfect people, messy people, and I would even say honest people, at least honest in their ability to say, I don't have it all together. They came to that same temple and the place that used, used to send a message that you are not enough for us now became the place where they heard the message from Jesus, you are enough for God. You are loved, you are valued, and God wants to bear fruit in your life. See, often I think God has to change his, his church in order to accept the people that God wants to change, the individuals. And I can only say that it's my hope that this can be that kind of place where every person, every color, every background, every hurt, every rejection, every shortcoming, every failure, that all of us together can limp to the temple and that Jesus and find us and make us whole. That's what happens when we seek Jesus. But it does involve one thing from us, and it's this, that we would stop and let the one who is seeking find us. That we'd stop running, that we'd stop pretending. The blind and the lame in this passage, they, they couldn't look like anything else. What makes us think we can? And because the blind and the lame allowed themselves to be found by Jesus, Jesus healed them. And Jesus can heal us. Jesus can heal you. But we have to stop pretending that we've made it, that we've arrived somewhere. The other day, I hired uh, an electric, uh, electrician through Angie's List because I had this um, porch light that was out our, by our garage, two, two porch lights. One of them wasn't working. 
Um, I tried to change the bulb, didn't work, so I knew, I knew it was not working. So I, I, I hired an electrician through Angie's List, and we, it took a while to figure out the schedule stuff. Eventually, they got there. Eventually, they, um, the electrician, he swapped out these two, two fixtures because he had to match the first one. First one couldn't be repaired, so I'm going to match it, so we had to buy two fixtures. So we did that, put two new fixtures in. He put them in, had, had me buy uh, you know, special LED bulbs for it, put those in. So he's done. He went away. They were working. A few days later, actually, on, on Isaac's birthday, um, I, it's during the daytime, and I decided I'd just, you know, flip on the porch lights just to, you know, see how they're working. And, and the ones on our porch were working, but they're tied to the ones by the garage, and neither of them came on. And I'm like, oh. I, it, I was like, man, you know, he did all his work, I paid this money, and now both of them don't work. It was, it was just frustrating. I, I just can't believe both of these don't work. And so I gave him a text. I shot him a text and said, hey, um, you know, the, the, the two lights now are not working. Could you come and resolve this? And I didn't even leave any emojis. So this is pretty stern for me, okay? No emojis, it's, it's like stern. And, um, and so, <laughs> So he, he replied back, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be there uh, today. I'll, I'll come and, and see what's going on. It was Isaac's birthday. He said, you don't, you don't have to come today. Just, just, um, just, just you know, come sometime soon if you can. Well, it turns into the nighttime, and they both turn on. <laughs> and so I text him back. I'm like, uh, for some reason, they, they both are on now. I don't know why. He, he says... <laughs> He says, are, are they um, the kind with sensors, the bulbs, the kind with sensors that automatically come on at night? And I was like, I don't know. And so I go out and look, and it's like, yes, they are. <laughs> and so there I am in the midst of being frustrated with this person, and I realized this was all my bad. So it took me a few days, but I texted him, and I apologized, and I said, I'm Sorry to bug you, they're the sensor lights, uh, totally <laughs> my mistake. It was humbling. I had to change. I had to see differently. Friends, Jesus will change us one way or another, but we choose the degree of difficulty for that change. How hard is it for Jesus to change you? Because it ultimately is only when individuals change that churches change and cities change. Because Jesus is a catalyst for individual change. I'll wrap up with this. Uh, Paula and I, we went to the coast uh, a little while ago, a few weeks ago, and we found ourselves going through Depot Bay. And at the time we were going through Depot Bay, uh, there was high waves, and so they were so high, they were, they were butting up against that. There's a bridge that goes across there, and they were, they were hitting it, and the waves were shooting like 30 feet, 40 feet into the air. It's just amazing. And we're, we're looking at that, and we're watching it, we're, and, and we both had the same idea. It's like, can we park as close to those as possible? We want to get where the, all that spray and all that stuff just lands on us. So we tried to get under it. We moved the car several times to get under this. We wanted to get as close as possible to this dynamic force for change. I want to experience it. Friends, that's what happens when we choose to get close to Jesus, choose to stop running and let him be near us. When we seek Jesus, when we let Jesus find us, we get close to this dynamic force for change. It's been said that we, we can't be afraid of change. You may feel very secure in the pond that you're in, but if you never venture out of it, you will never know that there is such a thing as an ocean. Jesus is always calling us to venture out, to seek him in the great sea of change. Just prior to this passage, there's uh, what's known as the triumphal entry. Jesus rides in on a donkey, People are shouting about Hosanna, shouting Hosanna to Jesus. Once again, this whole thing, it started with Jesus. He shows up in their town and in their church and in their life. Why? Because Jesus wants to change everything. And Jesus still 
wants to change everything. And everything includes you. Jesus wants to show up in your life. Jesus is seeking you. Will you be found? And will you in response seek Jesus for change? Change in our city, change in our church, change in people. But remember, the first person that Jesus wants to change in your life is you. So let's make sure we seek him for that kind of change. With that, let's pray.